All right, uh, let's get going. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen for a minute just to give you some introductory information um, as we start. Um, so welcome, this is the Science and Values in Climate Risk Management webinar series. I'm Casey Helgeson from the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. I'm one of the co-organizers of this series along with Nancy Tuwana, Klaus Keller and Rob Nicholas. Um, right now, I'm just going to tell you a few words about the series, then I'll go over some instructions for participating in the webinar today. I'll introduce the speaker and I'll hand over the floor. So about the series, um, climate risk management, for anyone not familiar with the phrase, is a broad umbrella term that includes doing things to slow down and stop climate change, as well as doing things to adapt to the changes that are already happening or will happen. The science and values part is a recognition that making decisions or taking actions requires, on the one hand, scientific or empirical knowledge. And on the other hand, uh, and equally important, also requires considerations of ethics and values. The series um, features speakers whose work advances the integration of these two sides, the science and the values. Um, and it, the series is supported by the Rock Ethics Institute and the Center for Climate Risk Management. Okay, let me introduce our speaker today. Kenneth Gillingham is an associate professor of economics at the Yale School of the Environment. In 2015 and 2016, he served as the senior economist for energy and the environment at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He has published widely on climate policy and on consumer decisions and policy in transportation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. He was a Fulbright Fellow in New Zealand and has also worked at Resources for the Future, the California Air Resources Board, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He received a PhD and two MS degrees from Stanford and an AB in Economics and Environmental Studies from Dartmouth College. And his title for today is Welfare Maximizing Climate Policy and the Role of Interregional Redistribution. Um, stopping my screen. Uh, Kenneth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm really uh, excited to be uh, presenting and really appreciate the invitation. Um, let me uh, share my screen right now. Great, I think you should be able to see it. So I'm gonna be presenting some work on climate policy and ethics. <clears throat> this is a, a really exciting area and I really should give uh, huge thanks and um, much credit to Simon Lang, who's also here uh, as a panelist. And uh, Simon is my PhD student at the Yale School of the Environment and he's doing some really great work on understanding climate policy and some of the ethical implications in climate policy. Uh, this is a uh, brand new work. It's a work in progress. Feedback is uh, very much welcome, but we have some, some interesting starting point results and we're at a point where feedback is uh, very, very, very much uh, appreciated. So uh, with that, I'm going to dive right in and um, begin uh, my presentation. Um, Climate change has very important normative aspects, and that should be uh, quite obvious to those in this seminar. There are many dimensions of heterogeneity, but three very, very important ones. There are heterogeneous responsibilities for causing climate change, who put the emissions up in the first place, the impacts of climate change affect people heterogeneously, and then the capabilities to mitigate and adapt differ across uh, countries and probably differ and likely differ across time as well. They're also, given this, there are a whole set of value judgments that are inescapable when you're going to weigh uh, both climate mitigation and climate impacts, uh, when you're thinking about it from space, time, time of impact, and uncertainty. When performing an analysis of climate policy, and especially when we start adding in the word optimal climate policy, which many analyses do, these uh, value judgments start to really play a key role. And this paper is really, this work is really about uncovering one of those areas, one of those key ways in which value judgments are playing a role and then explores some alternative ways to, to think about this. 
Uh, stepping back, this is from Nordhaus 2018. You could look at his 2010 work. You could look at his uh, Nobel Prize winning speech work. And you'll often see a baseline and an OPT in, in his words, which is an optimal trajectory of global mean temperature increase. His OPT in, is a little lower in his Nobel Prize winning speech, but it's, and, and with a different damage function actually as it is substantially lower. But in general, you're finding in, in Nordhaus's initial work uh, on optimal climate policy, you tend to see that the optimal in terms of economic efficiency, uh, economic efficiency optimizing in his view, uh, tends to be far above, say, keeping the temperature below 2.5 degrees C or, or stern. Uh, and we're going to explore what, what, how, how to think about what this optimality uh, looks like. There are a, a kind of key perspective here to think about this is that what, what is optimal? Um, and Nordhaus even recognizes this. He, he notes that uh, the use of optimization can be interpreted either in a positive point of view or descriptive point of view in which you're simulating the behavior of a system of competitive markets. And from a normative point of view as a possible approach to comparing the impact of alternative paths or policies on economic welfare. When we're thinking about things from a, an ethical perspective, we immediately kind of jump to the normative point of view. Most economists kind of take the, the positive point of view as a starting point and just say, you know, we're simulating the behavior of system of competitive markets. Um, but Nordhaus recognizes this distinction. He says, uh, we can interpret optimization models as a device for estimating the equilibrium of a market economy. As such, it does not necessarily have a normative interpretation. So Nordhaus is saying, well, this optimal path this is simulating, uh, this is kind of simulating competitive markets. Uh, it's not simulating competitive markets, you know, under a optimal carbon policy, of course, there's an optimal, there's a carbon price that brings us down from the baseline to the optimal. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have a normative interpretation. Now, of course, this, this type of uh, analysis is being used by policymakers to kind of design climate policies. And when you're in the policy process, the normative and ethical side is inherent, is inherent in, uh, in how you would think about signing climate policies, of course. Um, Stern puts it as if economists are going to engage seriously with policy, there's no alternative but to seriously engage in the ethical issues. Uh, and I think Nordhaus may, may agree with that, actually, that there are very clear ethical issues. Um, these ethical issues relate closely to equity issues. And this paper that, that I'm representing is very much about, about equity issues. So one starting point is thinking about uh, what are some of the ways in which equity is really playing out a role in these climate policy models. And I'm going to assume that most of the audience has seen enough of, of these climate policy models that I don't need to kind of give a background of what integrated assessment models are in general, but I'm highlighting a few key points here. You know, one is the social welfare function. Um, and there in almost all these models is, is some type of social welfare function. Um, and this is often used to uh, establish what outcomes are ethically preferable or, and that's in the normative sense, or find the market equilibrium in the positive sense. And uh, most commonly looking across models, some discounted utilitarian social welfare function, note that I have Nagishi weighted here and I'll, I'll get into what that is and what that means. Uh, but some sort of uh, discount utilitarian social welfare function uh, is generally the most common uh, approach where you are basically adding up the utility across people. There are obviously other alternatives, Rawlsian, prioritarian, there are other alternatives, but this is, you know, the, the kind of starting point that most of the integrated assessment models, unless they're being kind of played with in a different way, use. And this is, comes about, you know, Nordhaus's initial DICE model uh, for which uh, it was a large part of the contribution he won the Nobel Prize for, kind of starts with this. Um, there's also, there are also intergenerational equity issues. The issue of discounting, of course, is playing a role. And then there are intragenerational equity issues. And this is where Nagishi weights start actually to be playing an important role. Um, obviously, the modeling of inequality, heterogeneous climate impacts where they hit, equity weights uh, to aggregate monetary values, value of life. And this is, again, the Nagishi weights. So I'm going to get into to this as well. Nagishi weights. So when I started this project, uh, Simon said, you know, Nagishi weights are, are actually pretty interesting and they're 
uh, this understudied area. And I was like, oh, Megishi weights, everyone uses them. That's kind of standard. No, it's not, not that exciting. Uh, Simon's probably smiling right now. Um, but they actually play a really important role. So what are Nagishi welfare weights and how do they, what, what are they and how do they play a role and why does this, what does this mean for ethics? Well, Nagishi weights play a key role in the welfare function. So they're the inverse of the marginal utility of consumption, normalized to the sum of weights is one. So if you have a very wealthy person, generally the marginal utility of consumption is going to be low. Because if you give a wealthy person a little bit more money and a little bit more consumption, the added utility, the added happiness they get isn't going to be very high. If you give a poor person a little bit more consumption, a little bit more money, the added happiness they get is more likely to be higher. So that, so that, that is already a difference in the marginal utility of consumption across income. There may be differences across time, certainly differences across income, uh, so across regions based on income. So the Nagishi weights are effectively saying they're going to assign a greater weight to the welfare of the rich. So the Nagishi weighted uh, discounted utilitarian social welfare function says that social welfare is going to be the, the sum over time, the sum over people of uh, this Nagishi weight times the discounted utility. And that's kind of the number of people, right? Where the Nagishi weight is going to be the inverse of the marginal utility of consumption uh over the total of the all the marginal utilities of consumption so what does this mean it basically means that if you have uh if you're doing an analysis and you have multiple countries uh and one is poorer than the other and you're doing this at the country level you're giving more weight to the welfare of the rich country and this is kind of fundamental to uh many of the um, analyses that are doing uh country specific uh analyses or, or, or regional analyses why do they do this? So it sounds like on the surface, you're saying, well, it's kind of an odd thing to do. Well, Nagishi has a nice theorem that the maximization of the Nagishi weighted social welfare function yields a competitive equilibrium given the current endowments or given the current income across, uh, across regions, it yields a competitive equilibrium. Nordhaus and Yang noted that this time invariant Nagishi weight uh, objective that um, Nagishi in 1960 came up with leads to unsatisfactory uh, aspects of the solution. Um, it still doesn't fully prevent redistribution across regions, uh, in part because it's time invariant and there are differences in, in income across time. So one solution to Gordon Derhaus and Yang examined was exogenously constrained redistribution, but then the carbon price is not equalized uh, across space, which Nordhaus and Yang found uh, unappealing. So Nordhaus and Yang came up with a, the time variant Nagishi weight. So here you're saying, okay, instead of having these weights just across countries where you're down weighting the welfare of the poor and up weighting the welfare of the rich, you'll, uh, but doing that once over the whole time frame, you'd actually do that separately uh, during uh, each year. So that's kind of the, the uh, idea of the time variant Nagishi weight. This prevents redistribution uh, across regions in every period in order to maximize welfare for the whole time for, over everyone. It equalizes the carbon price across regions, so that that is nice because it avoids leakage issues. Um, and then it can help identify the uh, the competitive equilibrium. So this then gets us to the point with okay, so the Nagishi welfare weights uh, have this nice property that they help you nail down the competitive equilibrium. So why did Nordhaus and Yang think that this was a, a useful thing to do? Well, they went back, this goes back to the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Under certain conditions, no uninternalized externalities, for example, the competitive equilibrium is Pareto efficient, that nobody can be made better off without somebody being worse off. So we're, on the, we're in the Calder-Hicks world here, Calder-Hicks efficiency world with potential Pareto improvements. By moving here, the competitive equilibrium uh, with abatement, you're, you're kind of picking this, the amount of abatement that brings you to this frontier where you have the global south versus the global north. Now, what this is by, by dividing this up into the global north and global south, we're kind of talking about wealthy countries versus poorer countries. And there's a utility possibility frontier. So you can get to kind of the, the maximum Pareto efficient world 
uh, where nobody can be made better off without someone else worse off uh, all along this curve. But of course, whether you're here with the average utility in Global North being very high and average utility in Global South being low, or up here where the utility in Global South is high and North is low, has enormous equity implications. There, you know, this is not kind of a, a necessarily an even uh, distribution by any means. Uh, and so this is kind of an example where the average utility in the Global South is low. But it is a competitive equilibrium with the carbon prices, of course, with a Pareto efficient abatement, amount of abatement. Does this competitive equilibrium maximize social welfare is the next question. So just because it's Pareto efficient doesn't necessarily mean that it maximizes social welfare because it really depends on what the social welfare function is. If you have the Nagishi weighted social welfare function, which is what I had here in this slide. So if this is a Nagishi weighted social welfare function, wonderful, you're at this point. You're right, you're right where you wanna be. Uh, and so if that is your social welfare function, then that social welfare function gets you to the Pareto efficient point, which is also the point of the competitive equilibrium with that carbon pricing, and we're in an efficient place. Uh, so what's special about it is it's the only Pareto efficient outcome that doesn't require some sort of lump sum transfers. So for example, if you had a purely utilitarian social welfare function, so take this social welfare function and drop the Nagishi weights, then that would mean higher utility for the global south and lower utility for the, the, the global north uh, up here, but that would require some, some transfers to get there. The competitive equilibrium would take us here and then with the carbon pricing and then transfers could take us anywhere else along the curve. And Nordhaus in his work recognizes this and recognizes, yes, yeah, so, so we're just try I'm trying to get us to the efficient point and then society will decide where, you know, what the social welfare function is for the globe, which is through diplomacy and all the many other things, and, uh, and will take us to uh, whatever lump sum transfers that get us uh, to the final point. Uh, one argument for why the welfare ought to be Nagishi weighted uh, is that the Nagishi solution maximizes this Nagishi weighted social welfare function. And uh, there are, you know, but this means large disparities in welfare weights across regions. So the Rice model, which is a regional version of Nordhaus's classic dice model, uh, that's the Nordhaus and Yang paper. So the Rice model shows uh, quite large differences in welfare weights in which Africa is effectively downweighted relative to the US very substantially. Now, I don't believe that this is my, our guess, this is Simon and my guess, that most economists probably don't believe that those Nagishi weights have a, have a strong normative justification, that, that they necessarily uh, match what uh, the social welfare function for the globe act actually should be. They probably find that this is very appealing and why Nordhaus stops there, because you can do a competitive equilibrium and kind of get to that, that spot. But depending on the social welfare function, obviously could leave you very far away from what the true social welfare function uh, would, would, get, would land you. Now, of course, true social welfare function, their aggregation problems, I recognize all of these sorts of things too. Um, but, uh, but do Nagishi weights have a norm of justification? Probably not, there is just a super convenient way to get to this competitive equilibrium. So are you, that argument would say that the Nagishi solution only has a positive interpretation, that it's really a procedure to identify the competitive equilibrium with Pareto efficient abatement and zero redistribution. Yet this is a procedure that's very widely used in regional models, in models of climate change that have regional. Uh, now, if you have a globe, if you're a global model, it's not an issue. This is for regional models when you're trying to get to the competitive equilibrium. Nordhaus himself acknowledges that the Nagishi solution may not be attractive from a normative perspective. He says, you know, if the distribution of endowments across individuals, nations, or time is ethically unacceptable, then the maximization is purely algorithmic and has no compelling normative properties. So this is a you know, pretty, pretty strong statement to be saying that, uh, that, that kind of the foundation that a lot of the, the regional models are, are based on uh, has no compelling normative properties, but we're using these, these models uh, widely uh, for, and not all the models are based on the Yishi weights, of course, but, but you know, that's a very common approach based on the Nordhaus and Yang. Uh, to, uh, to actually help underpin discussions about climate policy. 
So one of the arguments that Nordhaus would use would say, okay, we're, we're kind of at, we can get to this point with the competitive equilibrium. So we're at the, the frontier between how much the utility that the South, that the global South gets and how much utility the global North gets. And the second fundamental theorem says, if you can do unrestricted lump sum transfers, you can get to any of these points. Um, it has been noted that these distributional issues uh, and Pareto efficiency are, may not be perfectly separable and that the Pareto efficient abatement level can actually defend, depend on the distribution of wealth. That can be for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, that, one could even think about that from a political reason, right? Um, but it also uh, depend, you know, is, is actually based directly on the theory. So, st so departing from this, um, the Yishi weight perspective uh, is a pretty interesting thing that economists have been thinking about at times. So Mark Jessen says if there's an absence or reluctance to use a political mechanism that would actually redistribute resource ownership and endowments appropriately, then the practical relevance of the second fundamental welfare theorem is severely limited. So basically, Marta Sen saying, uh, well, you know, so we can get here, then that's great, but how useful is it that we got here? We kind of want to get to the point where we're actually getting to the point where we're allocating across global south and global north for the, for the actual social welfare function, is in, in other words, what he's saying. Uh, and, and in reality, when we look across the world, redistribution is limited. So, you know, this is the Pareto efficient equilibrium with limited transfers and you could do, you know, minimal, if say you have some small transfers, you know, I assume from the north to the south, so that would move this little dot up this, up this direction, potentially. But if uh, the social welfare function would put us here, there we're pretty far away from the optimal kind of uh, point of, of overall social welfare. So thinking about this, there, there, you could think about the first best as a world where you had these unrestricted sufficient lump sum transfers. Exactly what Marcus Sen says, you know, the world that he, you know, if there's an absence of a reluctance to use a political mechanism to actually redistribute. So, so if, you know, you could actually redistribute, that would be the, the per first best. So you could get from here to this point, for example. This is, this is illustrative. I'm not saying the point is actually here necessarily. Um, but if you have insufficient availability of lump sum transfers, you only get partway there. And if carbon prices are constrained to be equal, now no carbon prices constrained to be equal is very useful from a leakage perspective. Um, but if carbon prices are constrained to be equal, that's meaning that the, the countries that will, that all countries will kind of lose the same, a similar amount of consumption potentially uh, they'll do a similar amount of abatement, but that abatement's much more costly in terms of welfare uh, in the countries that are poorer because every bit of consumption has a high, much higher marginal utility. So that kind of moves it to, to the third best perspective here. Um, so if you have an Igishi weighted social welfare function, uh, then no transfers are needed and you're fine. So you're, you're perfect right here. But if you have any other social welfare function that, uh, that combines and aggregates people's preferences uh, that say weights the poor um, equally with the wealthy, then you're gonna be potentially pretty far off. So that's the basic idea. So there've been some critiques about these Nigishi weights. They, the Nigishi weights have long been like, oh, you know, we know about these, we're not super comfortable with these, but they're sort of necessary to to get us to that competitive equilibrium. And so from a positive descriptive perspective, we like that. Um, but there, you know, it's been recognized that there are ethical issues because it assumes the welfare of rich individuals is, is more valuable. Um, it ignores aspects of interregional equity. It equalizes the, the weight of marginal utility consumption. Theoretically, um, there's some reasons to, to be unhappy with this. Uh, it can distort time preferences is one, one part because uh, if you have um, uh, in time invariant um, weights that could, uh, um, or sorry, time varying weights that would distort the time preferences. Um, you could have diminishing marginal utility. That's in, if there's something theoretically odd about having diminishing marginal utility that's embraced intertemporally, but suppressed interregionally. 
So the idea here is that uh, if you have time varying weights, right, you are capturing the idea that you might be richer in the future. Um, and you're, so you're embracing this idea and that may affect how much value, you know, how much welfare weight you put on the future versus today. And so you're embracing that by these time varying weights, but then within each time period, you're suppressing any interregional differences. Um, and then procedurally, uh, Abbott and Fennish will talk about how there's no or little discussion of these, these ethical implications. Uh, just kind of the, the point that, that uh, the broader community who's, you know, both the, the producers of, of, uh, of climate policy analyses as well as the consumers rarely uh, bring up these points. They mostly focus on discounting, for example. Uh, not to say it's never been done. There are, you know, there are a few papers who are, who are talking about this, but it hasn't been done that often. So this paper, you know, take me some time to get to the, the motivation, but, uh, but there, there's some technical details to get to, to, to get here. Um, but this, this paper is really about the fact that there are these critiques of Nagishi weights, but really little work on modeling alternatives out there um, and, and how important some of these implications might be. Um, more broadly, the role of interregional transfers on the welfare maximizing climate policy path is relatively unexplored. Yet, you know, we see discussions of $100 million need to be added, need to be, um, ha you could have conditional transfers of $100 million that have been discussed from the global north to the global south. Sorry, $100 billion, not $100 million, $100 billion. Uh, Simon's probably laughing about that as, as well. Um, and, uh, and so, <clears throat> Given that that this is relatively unexplored, it's, we believe it's important to um, explore the modeling alternatives. There's been a little of this in the previous work, but not much. Um, relax this constraint of zero transfers. So suppose we follow the developed countries goal of the 100 billion uh, being jointly mobilized. Uh, what does that mean? And then to evaluate policy implications of this. How does a normative solution differ from the positive solution? And how does the welfare maximizing climate policy path depend on the interregional transfers? So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the relative, the, the relevant literature uh, for time reasons. This does relate to, to work, the original work in, in Rice. Uh, this does relate to some of the nice work by David Antoff on equity weighting, but it's distinctly different than, than equity weighting and how it works. Happy to talk about that in, in Q and A. And then it does relate to some of the theory work about Nagishi weights and, and things that people found uncomfortable about. We feel our contribution is um, both presenting the modeling alternatives and their implications and evaluating how interregional transfers alter well, the welfare maximizing uh, climate policy trajectory. So basically, if you allow for these interregional transfers, um, what does that mean? And our main results are there, there are arguably attractive modeling alternatives that do yield different optimal policy trajectories that non-conditional transfers uh, end up playing a relatively minor role, but conditional transfers can result in more stringent climate policy. And a conditional transfer here, and in, in, in what we're referring to, is a transfer, say, from the global north to the global south, that's actually targeted at climate mitigation or abatement of, of carbon emissions. So to do this, we are going to use a modification of the RICE model. This is the Nordhaus and Yang Regional Integrated Model of Climate and Economy. Or has was very good with his acronyms. Um, and this is a regionally disaggregated cost benefit model, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's been used in many papers already. It is based on a Ramsey model, a neoclassical optimal growth model. It has 12 regions and uh, two damage sectors, a sea level rise and, and non sea level rise um, of different types of damages, different types of damages related directly to sea level rise and damages related to we don't change most of the, the main parameters of this. We're only going to change a few things. Uh, and this, uh, I think, is to elucidate um, what we're doing and, and why it's interesting. Uh, so the modifications we do uh, perform are we implement a normatively founded optimization problem, a set of normatively founded optimization problems. Um, now, no, there obviously is, it could be a, an argument for the, the Nagishi weight as a normatively founded optimization problem, but it's largely more a positive uh, optimization problem uh, and implement uh, exogenous or interregional transfers and say, what if, what if the Paris agreements, $100 billion comes about, what would that do if it's a, a conditional transfer or an unconditional transfer? So 
from a positive perspective, we first uh, look at the Nagishi solution. So that's the comparison. And that's the Nordhaus and Yang standard uh, RICE 2010 model. Unconstrained optimization of the Nagishi weighted. So we're maximizing uh, welfare and we're choosing the carbon price uh, that maximizes welfare over time. From a normative perspective, we're looking at a differentiated carbon price solution and a uniform carbon price solution. So the differentiated carbon price solution, so then you remember the Nagishi solution is, is convenient, it gives the same carbon price across all countries, but that's ethically kind of seems problematic. It's very nice from a leakage perspective. So that's a, a very clear caveat. Um, but, uh, but ethically, it means you're, you know, making those poorer countries, as I said before, do just as much abatement as much wealthier countries when the, the marginal cost uh, on welfare, the marginal welfare cost is much higher. Uh, so we do constrain maximization of a utilitarian social welfare function. So basically we take the, the Nagishi weighted social welfare function that I've talked about before and we pull out the omega. Um, and we provide a, a redistribution constraint that there's only so much redistribution that you permit. Uh, so basically we're solving the problem but adding a constraint. The uniform carbon price solution uh, holds a uniform carbon price, so it doesn't, uh, but also does a constraint maximization of the utilitarian. Um, and here we uh, basically add on a constraint for redistribution, a constraint for equal carbon prices. There are some attractive pro properties of this from an ethical perspective. <clears throat> so, you know, normative justification, there arguably, um, this utilitarian social welfare function, when you just kind of sit back and think about it from an ethical perspective. One may not like the utilitarianism uh, and want to go with a Rawlsian or something something else, of course. So in the world of utilitarian social welfare functions, um, this seems like a, a preferable one or a more obviously preferable one than a Nikishi weighted one. Um, the welfare effects uh, are not distorted and there could be, and there's also transparent implementation of redistribution and carbon price constraints. So one nice thing about this is um, the value judgments are really explicit. So in this, for all individuals over all time, the utility is a concave function of consumption. So higher marginal utility for poor people, lower marginal utility for wealthy people. Um, you know, there, that means that there are different levels of inequality aversion, which is the curvature that are applied and non-human welfare uh, is, is gonna be ignored in the way that we're calculating it. You could bring it in. There's some nice work bringing in some of this stuff. Uh, some non-human welfare impacts, but we're not working on that. Um, the, the other key value judgment that we want to make explicit about this utilitarian and social welfare function is it is an aggregation of utilities welfare. So the utility of people living in a particular time are given equal weight and people living in the future are given less weight due to discounting. So one could discuss all the many, you know, things related to, to discounting. When we look at these transfers, recall our, our scenarios allow for these interregional transfers. So we're going to go with this utilitarian social welfare function, but we're going to allow for, for transfers. So we consider no transfers, which is the standard in most IAMs. It's very rare to, to see an analysis with transfers in IAMs. And please tell us what we're, what we're missing at the end in the Q&A if there are papers out there that we haven't seen. Um, we look at non-conditional explicit transfers or conditional explicit transfers. So non-conditional explicit transfers means take $100 billion from the global north and hand it to the global south. Conditional explicit transfers say, uh, take $100 billion from the global north and spend it only on abatement in the global south. And then we also look at implicit transfers through differential carbon prices. Um, how do we implement this? Very briefly. Uh, the rich four regions are the donors, US, EU, Japan, and other high income. The remaining eight regions are receive the transfers, and we, we pass them out, pass the money out in proportion to population. Uh, the transfer quantities, we look at um, 100, so basically 0.1 trillion, 1 trillion, and 10 trillion. So we, we have to go a lot bigger than the 100 billion uh, to start to see things, which is why we have these higher up ones. Uh, exogenous constant or rising with GDP over time our options we do. So just a, for a, a little bit of insight, uh, we do, we have a little analytical model. Um, this is just a two period model, two region model with the optimization problem where we have the, a utilitarian social welfare function with a constraint of zero redistribution. And for just for the purposes of this, we use a logarithmic utility function. 
So if we set up the problem this way, just for intuition, where we have these constraints here. So this is consumption in period one, consumption in period two, consumption in period one is output minus uh, abatement costs. Consumption in period two is the same. This will yield uh, differenti differentiated carbon prices um, where the um, marginal cost of abatement uh, is gonna be the ratio of the marginal cost of abatement in the north and south is gonna be uh, equal to these, this ratio of, uh, of consumption. So the, that basically implies that if you really want to be maximizing a utilitarian social welfare function, we are gonna be seeing the marginal abatement cost higher in rich regions. Um, and that obviously further welfare gains can be uh, achieved by trading emissions. So this is just a, a quick analytical way to get a little bit of insight. So now I'm gonna to move to the numerics uh, and use my, uh, my remaining time to really focus on, on the numerical results. Okay, so what do we have here? We have, if you have a differentiated carbon price, and so the, the analytical model and you know emphasize that that differentiated carbon price you may have leakage issues but it will provide you with a uh, higher overall utility because it means that the carbon price is going to be higher in the rich regions where they have lower marginal utility um so a differentiated carbon price or a uniform carbon price so the red line there is the nagishi objective what we're plotting here is the atmospheric temperature change so these are paths, optimal paths, now optimal under different criterion, of course, uh, criteria. Um, these are the atmospheric temperature change over time. So with the Nagishi weights, you are gonna have a path that leads you to the highest temperature change. The carbon prices are gonna be much lower than, uh, than some of these others. We do this for both uh, the dotted line, which is uh, utility discount rate, which is a pure rate of time preference. So the pure rate of time preference is either 0.1 as suggested by Stern or, or 1.5 here, uh, which is much closer to the kind of Nordhaus numbers. Um, so obviously discounting plays a huge role. But one of the points here is that moving from the Nagishi solution to uh, solutions with redistribution also plays a role. So what we have here is moving from the Nagishi solution straight to the utilitarian solution, but with no redistribution, which is the, the um, green line here, uh, will bring you quite a bit down. The redistribution solution uh, actually has you go up a little bit with a differentiated carbon price and down a little bit with a uniform carbon price. And this is pretty interesting. So basically when you already have a differentiated carbon price, uh, the redistribution um, moves you up in marginal utility in, uh, already in some of those uh, regions that are receiving the money, um, and thus uh, the optimal value turns out to be a little bit higher. Um, when you have a uniform carbon price, that, that's not the case. So that's kind of a, a really uh, interesting point there. Um, and again, it's because the differentiated car differentiated carbon price has much higher carbon price in the rich regions and lower in the poor regions. Um, here we have uh, the carbon price and emissions trajectories. So I'm going to present three different ones and I'm starting with the Nagishi one and I'm doing this just so I can kind of explain and this breaks it down by the regions. So here I'm plotting the carbon price and here we have the emissions paths. Okay so let's look at the ones at the top. The top are going to be uh, the EU, uh, Japan is at the top. Um, so some of the, the, the wealthier regions uh, are kind of mixed, are, are there's kind of this mix that's in here. The ordering when you have a uniform carbon price is kind of similar. Note that there is generally with a uniform price, uh, similar trajectories to the Nagishi objective. Uh, you know, US is kind of falling right in here. When you have the differentiated carbon price, we really see the um, US, and so remember, this is, this is optimizing under the utilitarian uh, social welfare function. You really see the US and the developed nations having much, much higher um, carbon prices. And what does that mean for emissions? 
that means that uh, you know the U.S. So these these countries are all gonna that have these high carbon prices are all gonna drop their emissions really quickly. So if you allow for a differentiated carbon price world with the utilitarian uh, social welfare function, it's basically very quickly having you run into a place where uh, the wealthy nations are really dropping very fast. You don't see that just just from switching from the Nagishi weight uh, Nagishi objective to the uniform uh, carbon objective. So what are some of these, these prices? Um, this is with the period of time preference or um, utility discount rate being 1.5, and this is with it being 0.1. Uh, so the Nagishi solution gives you uh, $17 per ton or $69 per ton, depending on the discount rate you use, so relatively low carbon price. Uh, if you have a uniform carbon price and you have interregional transfers, doesn't make a it actually doesn't seem to make a huge difference. So if you require by constraint a uniform carbon price, uh, there there doesn't seem to be a, a huge difference here uh, until you know you start to see some difference when it's a ten trillion dollar a year difference. That starts to shift around um, wealth enough that you're um, actually changing the marginal utilities. When you allow for a differentiated carbon price world, it's it's interesting. Uh, so there. The U.S. should immediately dive in with a, a very large carbon price, um, and that carbon price, though, actually drops with higher interregional transfers, right? So if you, if you you know take a bunch of money from the U.S. and give it to other countries, and then you're trying to optimize, you're actually uh, you're actually going to be um, leading to the U.S.'s marginal utility to be you know relatively lower. Uh, and the poor countries' marginal utility be relatively higher, so you see, you know, kind of a shift up in the um, carbon prices of um, some of the poorer countries in the world, and a shift down for some of the wealthier countries. Which is pretty interesting how that works in optimization. We can look at the cumulative carbon emissions. And so, with redistribution, with the, the Nagishi objective. Uh, versus um, with the utilitarian objective and no transfers or with, with ones with transfers. Um, and you can look across uh, these. So the, the cumulative industrial emissions are much, much, much higher under these Nagishi weights for some of the wealthy countries of the world, which is a kind of a really strong result that, that comes out of this. And it's, it's intuitive when you think about it because these Nagishi weights are really upweighting the U.S., uh, quite a bit. And so uh, when they're, they're upweighting the U.S.'s welfare loss from decreasing emissions, you don't want to decrease emissions in the U.S. or other wealthy countries as much. We also look at the differentiated carbon price optimum uh, and more carefully. And there's a nice paper uh, by Budolfsson and Dedding that provide a discussion of this differentiated carbon price optimum. So it has some insight that's, that's worth mentioning. Um, so it, it does result in an implicit redistribution from rich to poor regions. Uh, so when you have differentiated carbon prices, you, that, there is going to be that redistribution going on. Um, but at least in theory, setting aside leakage, setting aside some, some of these other things, the uniform carbon price optimum is generally welfare inferior in the absence of sufficient transfers. So, and, and that's coming about from the same logic I, I talked about before, that you're, you're still um, not going to be accounting for the differences in the marginal utility from an added, added bit of consumption from wealthy countries and poor countries. So the, the, kind of the, the pure ethical aspect there. Um, they also talk about a principle of common but differentiated represent, uh, responsibilities and respective capabilities. Um, they mentioned that further welfare improvements over this differentiated objective could be achieved by establishing international emissions trading scheme. So we thought these were worth um, mentioning. But what we've seen so far, we've seen that implicit transfers through differentiated carbon prices. So if you have differentiated carbon prices, that implicitly means that there are gonna be transfers going on. Those are different than explicit transfers where you actually explicitly hand take money from one party and hand it to the other. Um, it's an implicit transfer in the sense that um, when you have these differentiated carbon prices, if you're optimizing over a social welfare function of the whole world, the very wealthy countries are going to be having much higher carbon prices and abating much more. And that's kind of that's what we saw in this, this uh, plot here. 
So the remaining question is, what about explicit conditional transfers? And how does the effect of explicit transfers depend on the parameterization? So here we're still working on this a little bit, um, but one of the things that we found so far is that explicit non-conditional transfers play a minor role, as I said, whereas conditional transfers play actually a major role. And this actually is the case under both uniform and differentiated carbon, the carbon price. So the short, and the short finding here is that if you actually have conditional transfers, particularly in the near term, uh, where you take money from the, the north and use it for abatement in the south, this actually justifies uh, much higher carbon prices in general, which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, and, and again, the, the reason for that is that when you are taking it and, and using it to, uh, to reduce uh, it will not just more harm in carbon prices, but actually more abatement, substantially more abatement in the south. So that's kind of a, an interesting point that, that comes out there. And why is it? Well, the welfare cost of abatement is lower if it's financed by the rich regions. So the rich regions are paying for it. The marginal utility or the cost on towards welfare of that is, is going to be less. Um, in the differentiated carbon price solution, the carbon prices are initially quite low in poor regions. Um, and even small conditional transfers yield abatement levels that exceed the abatement level in the absence of transfers. Under the uniform carbon price solution, the welfare maximizing carbon price balances out the discounted welfare costs and benefits from abatement. So there's a kind of a clear intuition behind why, why this is playing out here. Uh, I wanted to just provide it, make sure there was time for a graph. Um, it also relates, of course, to inequality aversion. So if you have um, higher inequality aversion here, you're gonna, especially in the near term with higher redistribution, have higher optimal carbon prices under conditional transfers. And that's a result I'd love to hear if anyone has, uh, has seen this result anywhere else in the literature, but that this is a result that we believe uh, might be new to the literature. Um, so I wanna finish uh, to make sure there's some time for Q&A. Uh, some key takeaways. Well, yes, Nagishi weights have been criticized. They have a very, very, very nice maybe I'm more positive on them than, than Simon, but I think they have a very nice positive um, interpretation. Uh, but from an ethical, if you're thinking about it from a complete social welfare perspective, it's, it's uncomfortable, I'll say that. They're, they're somewhat uncomfortable. Um, you know, that there, there are the attractive modeling alternatives to using the Gishi weights. And one of them we said was just um, actually, you know, not using the Gishi weights, but constraining the amount of redistribution. Because you know, one of, one of the points is when you get rid of Nagishi weights, they often tell you, since the marginal utility in rich countries is so high, is so low, and the marginal utility of poor countries is so high, we should be redistributing a lot today already to maximize social welfare function. And Nagishi weights say, well, wait, we're not doing that already. And so since we're not doing that already, uh, why should we be kind of trying to find that, that place? And that's, that's an argument for Nagishi weights. But you could also get rid of Nagishi weights, which are kind of just uncomfortable, and put a constraint on to prevent, to prevent transfers, um, either completely prevent transfers or to allow some amount of transfers. Removing it greatly increases the stringency of welfare maximizing uh, policy, and it also uh, influences um, quite a bit in terms of how differentiated carbon price uh, optimum, so that the differentiated carbon price optimum might be uh, even more different at times. Um, especially with some of the wealthy countries really paying, uh, having a much higher carbon price. So final takeaways are um, the non-conditional interregional transfers play a major role. So it's really, if you just take money from the, the, the North, the global North and send it to the global South, that doesn't change stringency of welfare maximizing climate policy very much. But if you actually take the money from the global North and use it to finance abatement in the global South, that does actually increase the stringency of climate policy relatively substantially. The welfare maximizing uniform carbon price roughly doubles uh, for a total global transfer, conditional global transfer of $100 billion a year. So it can really make a pretty big difference. And with that, I have eight minutes or seven minutes for questions. Um, so I thank you so much for your attention and would really love feedback. And I'm looking forward to a conversation with uh, whoever can make it uh, in the future to talk about this. Thank you, Kenneth. 
Um, I'm going to give people just a minute to digest and um, raise hands or put things into the chat. Um, if nobody jumps up in a few seconds, I'll kick things off. Okay, so I'll start. Um, so uh, this is a question about, um, probably this is answered in the details that I just didn't follow, but um, in your motivating material at the beginning, uh, it struck me that um, there's a kind of division of ethical labor between the um, optimality analysis and then the potential for transfers afterwards that would move you along that Pareto front between the North and the South. Um, so you were, in, in this work, you're building more um, ethics into the optimality analysis. Could you talk a little bit about how that partitions that ethical division of labor? In other words, like what is still left out that ought to be considered in um, thinking about where to push policy along that Pareto front, even after you've found the optimality according to this approach? Yeah, that's, that's a, a fair point. Uh, really good point. I, I think you're exactly right in that the way that we, uh, let me actually take down my slides so you can see me more broadly. The way in which we uh, set this up does, um, well, the way in which it's traditionally set up, you're completely right, does tend to separate out the ethics from, first, we want to try and get things uh, to the frontier. And that is really nice from the Calder Hicks perspective. And then after that, then the world decides how they want to move along that frontier. And that is the very, that is the traditional logic. And, and there, you know, people like economists like that logic. A lot of economists really like that logic. What we're trying to do, as you said, is try to build in um, the, the explicit, explicit social welfare function. Um, what we're, you know, not doing is uh, solving. So we're focusing on climate. There are a whole set of other ethical considerations that were either are implicit in what we're doing. Uh, so discounting, for example, um, ethical considerations relating to, uh, re relating to non-human impacts, all of those things are, are kind of still implicit. And then, you know, in, in a sense, we're, we're trying to get at social welfare function using social welfare, using one tool, which is climate policy, but, you know, I'm not going to pretend that climate policy is the only tool in the toolkit to try and get at overall social welfare. So in some sense, we're constrained as well in that we're asking the question um, by focusing on climate um, and by car and climate policy, rather than kind of stepping back and thinking about tax policy and, and all these other policies, which are sort of, you know, held fixed, if you will, um, in our analysis, we're using this, this kind of one lever I think that's an important um, distinction and way to think about this. Thanks. Um, Simon, did you want to add anything to that? I want to give him an opportunity as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, great. Right. Um, yeah, maybe just to clarify again, I think our logic is that um, if we have unrestricted access to transfers, then what we can do is first move to the operator frontier and then redistribute to get anywhere on the, on the frontier. Um, the problem with that is, in my view, that we don't have access to those unrestricted transfers. So the approach is sort of to take as given uh, the transfers that have been agreed on, um, for example, in the Paris Agreement, the $100 billion per year, um, take that as the constraint, and then realize that that doesn't really get us very far in terms of uh, you know, an, an equitable uh, outcome. So then we have to build in some equity in issues into the climate policy, uh, you know, in, into the climate policy trajectory as well. And you know, how carbon prices may differ between different countries, or at the very least, it would set another constraint of, uh, of you know, wanting to have an equal carbon price. Um, the logic is then, that at least we should uh, capture that a certain damage uh, has a greater welfare impact to the poor than to the rich. So in a sense, we want to still capture that the marginal utility is different uh, for a rich person and the poor person. So a dollar to a rich person is of, uh, you know, 
smaller value than a dollar to a poor person. And you know, that's the logic for sort of the, the third um, optimization problem with the uniform carbon price. Thanks. Um, we do have a, a comment in the chat for, for both of you, but it's, uh, it's not a question for now. It's a, kind of a follow-up for later. Um, we are actually almost at five o'clock. Um, so unless someone jumps in very quickly, I'm going to actually close us down for today. Going well, on. I just want to say quickly, thank you all for, for your attention. Please, please feel free to be in touch with any thoughts, either um, from the ethical perspective about what, what we're missing, thoughts from the integrated assessment perspective. There are a lot of, I've looked at the attendee list, there's a lot of smart people on this call um, and would, um, would you know love further conversation. Great, thank you so much, Kenneth. And thank you, Simon. I have my one final little um, plug is just to mention the next webinar in the series that is, um, Uh, Dale Jamison on November 5th. You can visit the REI website if you want to sign up for that. Um, and with that, thank you all for attending and um, we'll sign off.